Well, uh, hello, everybody. I'm, uh, this is a slide presentation. You don't have to look at me for the next 45 minutes or so. And because it is about the land, we have so many pretty pictures to show you. Um, this uh, is the last in the uh, lecture series, as Norm told you, about living with the land. And I want to begin, and I'll talk a little bit more about who Leopold was and, and uh, you know, why I think he's significant. And, but I want to begin with this quote from Leopold. He's writing home. He's at a school in New Jersey. His parents sent him to a boarding school. Uh, he's 17 years old, and a Native American elder came to his school to talk about nature. And Leopold writes home to his parents. He said, after speaking of the Indian's knowledge of nature, nature is the gate to the great mystery. The words are simple enough, but the meaning unfathomable. Well, again, that's Leopold writing home to his parents. Now, a lot of people have struggled with this unfathomable meaning of nature uh, from the past, you know, Socrates, Spinoza, and whatnot in the past, and today people like Annie Dillard and Wendell Berry. But as this quote really foreshadows, few authors would wrestle more eloquently with that meaning uh, than Aldo Leopold. Now, a key figure in environmental history, Leopold came to Arizona in 1909. So at the start, it's worth remembering something about the natural and cultural world that he stepped into. Now, when Norm mentioned uh, these NEH institutes, I just want to talk about how, just quickly about how this sort of presentation came about. Uh, in 2009, it was the centennial of Leopold's arrival here in Arizona. He arrived in 1909. And there were a lot of activities in Arizona and New Mexico to celebrate his arrival. So my colleague, Joe McGregor, who teaches philosophy at ASU and I, we did a, a month long institute for people who teach Leopold uh, at the college level. And uh, we did that in 2009. It was so successful that NEH asked us to do it again. We did it in 2011. I thought I was retired, but we did it again in 2016. And with each one of these, we started to see that, that indigenous and Native American views were, were, were coming more and more to the fore. And so that led us to a woman named Melissa Nelson, who, by the way, is the brand new director of indigenous sustainability at Arizona State. Uh, she was at San Francisco State when I met her. But Melissa has been looking as well in her books at what's called traditional ecological knowledge. That is, what can we learn from indigenous people about our relationship to the land? So that's where Leopold figures into this. And with, as I studied Leopold more and more, I started to see that he really was going back to indigenous ideas. Now, a key figure in environmental history, Leopold, as I said, came here in 1909 uh, his career played out in the Southwest and in the Midwest. So he's regarded and, as, uh, and remembered as one of the founders of the Wilderness Society. He originated what became called game management. He was the architect of wilderness areas. Uh, he was a critic of DDT 20 years before Rachel Carson, uh, an early practitioner of what we call land cooperatives, and well ahead of his time, he was an activist who suggested boycotting products made with child labor or in an environmentally harmful manner. Moreover, Leopold authored hundreds of technical articles about trees and dirt and forests, but he's generally regarded as the voice whose book, A Sand County Almanac, launched the discipline of environmental philosophy, environmental ethics in the 1970s, more than two decades after his death in 1948. So he's no trained philosopher, uh, educated as a forester at Yale when Gifford Pinchot's utilitarian creed sort of steered conservation policy. Leopold arrived here in 1909 to begin his career in the new Apache National Forest. That first year on the job, he probably never passed up an opportunity to shoot a predator especially the despised wolf. But after one incident, he sensed a disconnect between what he had learned in the Yale classrooms and this hillside lesson. 
which he'd write about 35 years later. And it's worth quoting or reading both of these. They're important. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then, have known ever since, that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean a hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. So what we have here is the mountain and the wolf are thinking. There is between them, quote, something known. So where are humans in this dialogue, asked Leopold in this 1944 essay, which is a landmark in nature writing and a pivotal essay in uh, San County Almanac. He shot the mother wolf near Springerville. This is the site. And if you want to know how we know the site now, I can talk about that later in the Q&A. Um, but it was a routine act to shoot a wolf since the Forest Service's eradication policy held that fewer predators benefited ranchers and hunters. But the ebbing green fire planted a thought that the young Leopold didn't really grasp, let alone express for decades, that nature's logic, what he would come to call mountain thinking, already regulated the hillside just fine without his university theories. In that moment, Leopold sensed at least some of this unfathomable meaning and eventually became a powerful voice for stewardship, speaking for all what he called the cogs and wheels and advocating a communal approach to nature best expressed in the land ethic, which is the book's final essay. In short, a land ethic changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. The land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively, the land. And one final one, Leopold is a quote machine. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the abiotic community, it is wrong when it tends otherwise. Now these passages certainly break with what earlier philosophers believed about the human nature relationship, or what manifest destiny decreed, or what utilitarianism endorsed, or what many felt the Bible sanctioned. But the core of Leopold's ethic, and this is my point here, was not new. He may have dressed it in modern scientific speech, but the underlying moral tone that he adopts would have been familiar to earlier civilizations. Leopold's long transition then from a young forest manager to an environmental sage parallels the nation's passage from unapologetic use and resourcism to a more aware conservation. When we consider the tools that nurtured his development, clearly Leopold's familiarity with conservation research played a role. Equally important was his appreciation of history and philosophy and other cultural leanings that pepper his prose. But as consequential and perhaps too often overlooked was the cultural heritage he absorbed here in the Southwest. Now Leopold wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth but compared to many others at the end of the 19th century, his childhood was very comfortable. With the Mississippi River and its surrounding hills as backdrops, Leopold's childhood was filled with outdoor passions instilled by his father, who was an avid hunter and who passed on a very strong ethical code to his son. Education was likely valued and to expand their son's horizons, his parents sent Aldo to an academy in New Jersey when he was 17, then provided for four years at Yale, where he was a graduate of Gifford Pinchot's Young Forestry Program. During holidays, he might escape with his family to a new national park or vacation at a boating community on the Great Lakes. His comfortable lifestyle was about to change. Leopold 
would live through one of the most momentous periods in the history of land management policymaking. And importantly, he lived in places where those policies were stark and consequential. During his 40 year career, he witnessed the birth of the National Park Service and other land agencies, the popularization of the outdoors by the Boy Scouts, Sierra Club and more, a surge of nature-based literature and New Deal activities, logging, road building, parks, arts, construction, photography. Also, the early 20th century was framed by the conservation preservation debate captured in the expressions of Pinchot and Muir, both friends of Leopold's hero, Theodore Roosevelt, and spotlighted in the battle to dam Hetch Hetchy. That's the picture there of Hetch Hetchy. The first national environmental debate. Muir lost that battle in 1913 and was dead within a year. Now it's commonplace to say Leopold was a student of Pinchot's wise use approach and ended a disciple of the preservationist Muir. And while there are problems with that statement, to measure Leopold, it's a fair starting point. Certainly he begins in Pinchot's classroom, but while Leopold will eventually echo Muir's passions, his land ethic is more multifaceted. He knows, for instance, that not everybody can live alone like Muir did in the Sierra Nevada. He celebrates a third way. Today, we call it the radical center where use and preservation intersect. At the University of Wisconsin, where Leopold created one of the first land management programs, he encouraged students to appreciate, quote, the beauty as well as the utility of the whole, end quote. In his 1933 book, Game Management, which remained for decades the textbook for conservation, he was already contemplating an alternative. There is a third minority, he writes, who denies kitchens or factories need be ugly or farms lifeless. So from where did this third way spring? He drew from many sources, but to find one, look to the Southwest, to a fragile yet unforgiving landscape, and then look to the cultures who had sustained themselves there for thousands of years. Listen to the narratives of the Southwest's cultural geography. Aldo Leopold did. On a summer's day in 1909, with a master's degree from Yale in hand, this 22-year-old Iowan stepped from the train at Holbrook. If his Tom Mix attire seemed amateurish, so did Leopold's initial field work in Apache National Forest, whose boundaries had been drawn, by the way, just a year before he arrived. More than a few colleagues questioned the new man's skills, especially after he botched his first assignment, but within a year he had proven himself only to suffer a kidney ailment in 1913 that nearly killed him, alone, on a mountain, a day's ride from home. Leopold's life, his journal suggests, may have been saved by an Indian. It was an ordeal that would forever curb his field work. He'd be forever a desk jockey, an administrator, working in government and public relations. When he arrived, Holbrook was a trading post for the Navajo Nation, a gateway to petrified forest, a new national monument. Founded in 1881, when the railroad reached Arizona, Holbrook, which was named for a railroad engineer like a lot of those towns along Route 66, was home to about 600 people, most eking out a living in ranching. Nearby Springerville, where Leopold worked for a short time, was a smaller community of about 300 mostly Mormons whose novel religion introduced yet another land ethic to rim country. Still three years from statehood, Arizona was home to about 200,000 people in 1909. Its territorial neighbor, New Mexico, where Leopold lived most of his Southwest career, was slightly larger at 327,000 people. Now, the population of Connecticut, where he had just attended Yale, was more than a million. So compared to Arizona, Connecticut held five times as many people on 1 20th of the land. From Leopold's first base of operations, the closest towns of any size were Albuquerque and Phoenix, both with populations of about 11,000, both more than 200 miles away. 
his new world differed from the East in one significant way, space. When the untried forester stepped into that immense space on July 16, 1909, he would not have seen a single automobile, paved road, or a substantial building. He would have seen Native Americans at the depot selling crafts. More than a few faces would have reflected their Mexican heritage. Intermarriage was common, as Leopold himself would attest. He wasn't in Burlington or New Haven anymore. As part of a team he supervised, Leopold might spend weeks riding across Apache National Forest's majestic mountains. I am lucky to be here in advance of the big works, he wrote home. I wouldn't trade it for anything else under the sun. The majesty of that place extended beyond natural landscapes to cultural vistas. And when Leopold arrived, the area's Indian nations in particular were undergoing tremendous change, political upheavals that continued throughout his 15 years in the Southwest. The resilience that Indian people demonstrated in the face of these crises was grounded in a personal, not an economic relationship to the land. That personal connection wasn't part of Leopold's Yale curriculum, but he eventually learned it, felt it, and embraced it. Let me go a bit of background here. Uh, while skirmishes into the, continued into the 20th century, for the most part, the Indian Wars had ended in 1886 with Geronimo's surrender to General Crook here, followed by the Apache leader's deportation to Florida and his death in 1909, the year Leopold first set foot on the uh, uh, mesas that the Apaches had wandered across here since basically the 1400s. If there was any question as to who won the Indian Wars, the answer came at Wounded Knee in 1890, the date Frederick Jackson Turner later singled out eloquently but mistakenly as the year the frontier closed. The uh, young historian, he was only 31, presented his influential thesis at the 1893 Columbian Exhibition in Chicago, where each day hundreds of thousands of fairgoers, including the Leopold family, marveled at the white city's electric lights, colossal exhibit halls, newfangled Ferris wheel, and Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, the crowds cheering a proxy sitting bull as he reenacted Custer's Montana stand. The actual leader of the Lakota Sioux was not available. During his months with Cody's show in 1885, the aging sitting bull met dignitaries, filled arenas, posed for photographs, such was his fame. Then he went home to South Dakota and was shot in the head by Indian agents at 1890, Turner's frontier closing date. Sitting bull's death was a closing, but not the one identified in Turner's thesis, which is a thinly disguised tribute to the march of civilization. Instead, his murder marked the passing of a way of life, not progress. By the time of his death, many Indians lived close to the edge of real danger, wrote Wallace Stegner, who like Leopold, was born in Iowa, then raised in Indian country, born in 1909 when Aldo arrived in the Southwest and Geronimo died far from home. Stegner grew up among a wounded people and a wounded land. Like others, he found purpose in Leopold's conviction that Americans must reevaluate their values. What he told us was that our minds have to change, that a revolution in our thinking must take place. Following Leopold's lead, Stegner found teachers close at hand, quote, we might well consider learning more from the Indian instead of trying to make a white man of him, said Stegner. When Leopold landed at Holbrook, many Southwest reservations had been established, including the Navajo, Hopi, Hualapai, Havasupai, and most Pueblo tribes in New Mexico. By 1924, when he left, Arizona had added the huge Tohono O'odham Reservation, among others, totaling 19 nations. Next door, New Mexico contained more than 20 smaller reservations. In Arizona and New Mexico, Aldo Leopold lived in the middle of Indian country. The famous Taos Pueblo was not far from the home that he and Estella built. 
from their residences in Albuquerque and Santa Fe, Pueblo communities were within a short ride. And most public lands Leopold inspected adjoined tribal territories. Much of what he saw was devastating. Now the writer Michael Doris once said, there has never been a greater misnomer than to call Indians the vanishing Americans. But earlier knowledgeable people, among them Leopold, wondered if indigenous cultures would survive. They had reason to think so. Depending upon whose figures one accepts, by 1900, between 65 and 99% of native people had been wiped out since contact. The loss of life from war and disease slowed in the 20th century, but other losses continued during Leopold's Southwest years. Considering that two thirds of Indian land in 1887 was in the hands of non-natives by 1934, he obviously witnessed the unrelenting theft of Indian soil. Still, while Leopold's Southwest years represented a low point for many tribes, the era also saw the dawn of self-determination. When he arrived, the routine of removal, long march, and relocation had almost ended, and by the time he departs in 1924, most tribal nations had settled on land they would never leave. These tribes also began to form governments, somewhat independent of federal oversight. Boarding schools were being closed. Medical centers, social agencies, and economic development programs were beginning to take place on Indian land. These achievements don't mask, however, the inequities in education, employment, and healthcare that continued on the res, often becoming worse as assimilation and termination policies swung in and out of political favor. To be clear, early 20th century reservations were among the most desperate places in the country, fixed in neglect and voicelessness. Upon his arrival in 1909, Leopold would have learned that the first inhabitants of Arizona and New Mexico were not citizens in the eyes of the federal government, a designation they wouldn't receive until 1924, the year Leopold left the Southwest. The original Americans would not be granted the right to vote in either state until 1948, the year Aldo died. Given the turmoil occurring on Indian land during Leopold's time in the Southwest, it's unlikely that someone of his nature in his profession would not have engaged these controversies, especially because the disputes and the laws and the treaties and the dispossessions concerned land, culture, and politics, three topics that consumed Leopold. After all, by the time he departed for Wisconsin, he had spent nearly 15 years wandering through, studying, and writing about a natural and cultural environment very different from his Iowa. That sense of place where indigenous and Hispanic traditions still influenced land use policy and society itself would have a subtle but ultimately profound effect on Leopold's evolution as a conservationist. It's no exaggeration to, to suggest that the culmination of Leopold's intellectual journey, his celebrated land ethic, had its genesis in the Southwest. Granted, when he left to become deputy director of Forest Products Lab in Wisconsin, Leopold wasn't close to articulating his famous statement, but he'd taken steps in that direction, questioning, for example, policies concerning fire, sustained yield, road building, predator control, and the value of wilderness. He'd also begun to speak about land health, that's his phrase, in terms that stressed ecological and moral obligations. The result, says his biographer Kurt Miney about Leopold's final years in the Southwest was, quote, a series of articles and speeches noteworthy for ecological insights decades ahead of their time. These insights reflect, among other things, his growing appreciation of, hold on, my phone was talking to me. <laughs> his growing appreciation of, of indigenous values, as he says here, five races have flourished here. We may truthfully say of our predecessors that they left the earth alive, undamaged. We, uh, Leopold's achievements 
writes historic, uh, historian Roderick Nash rested on more than a century of theological, philosophical, and scientific thought. Nash and others have traced many influences, including Leopold's use of Darwin's science and uh, Spencey's philosophy. <laughs> His embrace of nature writers like Muir and, ab and his adaptation of Sinclair Lewis, his criticism of capitalism, all these you know, are this amalgamation of what's inside of Leopold at this time. Recent studies cover a lot of this terrain, but less have been written about the influences of Native American and Mexican Americans on Leopold, even though their cultural environment surrounded him daily, personally and professionally. In 1912, for instance, Leopold married into a prosperous Hispanic family. His new in-laws managed one of the largest sheep ranches in the country. His marriage to the striking 22-year-old Estella Bergeret introduced Aldo not only to a new language, religion, and a cuisine, but also to another way of thinking about natural resources like water rights. Also, the couple's time in the Southwest marked the heyday of the Taos arts colony. Paintings by Blumenshine, stories by Cather and Austin. A young Robert Oppenheimer spent summers nearby, returning often later to build a device. Aldo and Estella, a former school teacher, were well suited to this bohemian setting. They loved opera and the theater, joined literary salons, and read voraciously. The period also saw the rise of tourism here in the Southwest, with Fred Harvey marketing exotic landscapes and nature cultures and Santa Fe Railroad happy to sponsor the travel. It was a development not lost on Leopold, who in 1917, 1918, was director of the Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce, where he encouraged tourism that celebrated the region's distinctive heritage. Contributing to that appeal, linguists, archeologists, and other scholars had discovered Indian cultures. Alongside photographers like Edward Curtis, they helped ignite an explosion of interest in native customs, languages, and crafts. Leopold is working in the middle of all this. Most importantly, the battles over land and water that he witnessed often involved tribal territory, where the disputes were as much cultural as geographical. The controversies would have been familiar to many in the Southwest since by Leopold's time, land was the economy. Moreover, as head of public relations uh, for the forest district, churning out newsletters about land issues, Leopold operated at the center of the political environment and cultural conflicts over land. He could not have failed to recognize the clash of values embedded in these battles among them, the establishment of the Grand Canyon in 19, uh, 1919 that required the removal of the Havasupai Indians. Leopold wrote, by the way, the, the park's first master plan in 1915. We had the return of the Chiricahua Apaches, it was a big story here, in 1913, after 20 years after their removal to Oklahoma. We had Carlos Montezuma, speaking, lobbying, starting a newspaper in, in 1916, earning a reputation as a troublemaker among authorities. And then we had amendments to the Dawes Act and the implementation of the Newlands Act. Dawes tried to turn Indians into you know, yeoman farmers while Newlands would create massive irrigation products, projects here in the West and many more. At their core, most of these disputes highlighted cultural differences over the meaning of land over concepts like ownership and best use. Like other government officials, Leopold had trained and worked in what he calls the age of engineers, a world of print and grids, a linear universe answerable to cause and effect, managed by overconfident experts. Indigenous worldviews, by contrast, were oral, not written down, obscure to outsiders, holistic rather than causal, humble, in nature's shadow. Early on, Leopold's comments tend to reflect standard industry practice, viewing natives as obstacles to a well-ordered man's landscape. Quote, the only hunting I've done this month is for Indians, he complains in a 1909 letter, but the SOBs got away from us. 
ignoring the fact that until recently, his forest was their home. While crafting plans for the Grand Canyon in 1915, he wonders, it's quite a question about how we're gonna handle the Supai Indians. Again, dismissing the tribe's historic bond to the canyon. However, always responsive to his cultural surroundings, which weave their way through his letters and journals and essays, Leopold eventually begins to speak a different language. As Julianne Newton observes about his final years in the Southwest, cultural expressions, the point of contention in many land use disputes, elbow their way into Leopold's thinking. Julianne writes, once again, determining and bringing about the desired end would involve cultural as well as ecological insights. The odyssey that Julianne traces was a combination of Leopold's training at Yale, his on the ground research with the Forest Service, and extensive readings in science, philosophy, history, and literature, all wrapped up in this Southwest heritage that was expressed at least partially through an indigenous outlet unwritten at the time, but discernible through its integration of land and culture. Leopold's journey will near its end with this celebration, with uh, his celebration of this bond. Culture is a state of awareness of the land's collective functioning. He had begun to speak and invoke the spiritual imperatives that characterize an indigenous views. In a 1923 article, he includes a section titled, Conservation as a Moral Issue. In 1924, he writes, we are crushing the last remnants of something that ought to be preserved for our spiritual welfare. So Leopold has approached the mountain and the wolf, and then he and the family leave for a very different environment in 1924. In Wisconsin, home to his hero, John Muir, Leopold's Southwest education is reinforced. The result of a, fascin a frustrating job, economic worries, ecological failures, looming wars, and close to home, a barren landscape absent the indigenous voices he had begun listening to in the Southwest. By, by 1848, when it became a state, Wisconsin had rid itself of many Indian lands and most native forests, a correlation that doesn't escape Leopold. Quote, most of the original inhabitants have been run out of Wisconsin. This applies not only to Indians, but also to grasses, flowers, shrubs, and in part to trees. In his new surroundings, where he would spend 24 years as an, as an administrator, consultant, and professor, Leopold saw more clearly the connection between nature and culture. Of no small consequence, whoop, I just lost something here. Uh, All right, sorry. Of no small consequence, uh, that's the button I wanted, was the, de was the depression. Uh, less than a year before the 1929 stock market crash, this was not a wise career move for Aldo, he left the forest products lab, exasperated with the job. For the next five years, until he secured a position at the University of Wisconsin, he hung out his uh, consulting forest shingle, hoping to provide during the depression uh, uh, for a large family and a new house. At the same time, the 1930s economic and agricultural disasters tested the nation's faith in the science that Pinchot and others had championed. The Southwest had chipped away at Leopold's confidence and now, by way of his extensive research, he experienced firsthand many ecological catastrophes engineered by college-trained experts. The Dust Bowl tested Leopold's faith in technological, what he called clean farming. The drought, erosion, and vanished topsoil that shocked the nation's heartland, he chalked up to the industrialization of agriculture, simply saying, our tools are better than we are. The Hopi, Leopold knew, grew corn on a rock in northeastern Arizona with little water for centuries. 
while modern farming had turned healthy soil to sand in a few decades. A three-month trip to Germany in 1935, where Leopold saw managed but artificial landscapes, left him feeling that foresters trained solely in economics did not fully appreciate land health, which he characterized by diversity, not monocultures. On that trip were the weeds of the forest and the weeds of society were being removed by the Nazis. He connected the environment and the greater good. Sitting in a Berlin hotel, Leopold jotted on a napkin that those who study the human community and the land community are barely aware of one another. Quote, the inevitable fusion of these two lines of thought will perhaps constitute the outstanding advancement of the present century, end quote. But at war's end with Germany's forests and Oppie's bomb coloring his thoughts, a troubled Leopold feels this fusion has not been realized. Science is mainly a race for power. Again, he knew that indigenous peoples lacked impressive scientific textbooks but they possessed the wisdom to live with forests without destroying them. Equally significant were trips to Mexico in the mid thirties to land that escaped the surveyor's chain, but which nonetheless appeared healthier than the territories he administered. It was here that I first clearly realized that land is an organism and that all my life I had seen only sick land. Sitting at the river's edge, Leopold weighed this perfect wilderness against the exhausted lands once in his custody. He muses that possibly someone else, someone earlier, had a better idea. There once were men capable of inhabiting a river without disrupting the harmony of its life. Perhaps the most significant episodes occurred on his own land. In 1935, Leopold bought 80 sickly acres, 50 miles north of Madison, site of his celebrated shack, where he, Estella, five children, and his students experimented with what he called working landscapes until Aldo died in 1948. The weekend trips to the shack also brought him into contact with other landowners and cultivating a conservation ethic among the public became one of his causes. He established land cooperatives, wrote a column for Wisconsin's Wildlife Magazine, spoke at many civic events, broadcast a regular radio program, and was embedded in politics, both legislative and grassroots. He rightly perceived that more land is held privately than in pu by public agencies, so if we're to restore land health, something other than government incentives is needed, something that appealed to the public's heart, not only its pocketbook. There must be some force behind conservation, he wrote, more universal than profit. I can see only one such force, a sense of love and obligation. Today, thousands of people continue to visit the shack and the nearby Heritage Center to celebrate that personal connection to the land. So what drew Leopold to this sense of love and ob obligation? Uh, other families own farms. Friends went with him to Mexico, others traveled to Germany, and everyone knew about the Dust Bowl, but they didn't write the conservation ethic in 1933 or the farmer as a conservationist in 1939, two essays that bookend an important phase of his development. The 1933 essay, which appears, uh, reappears actually in San County Almanac, introduces a new theme calling for philosophers to extend moral considerability beyond humans. Quote, there is as yet, he complains, no ethic dealing with man's relationship to land, end quote. The later essay, in the wake of a tempest of topsoil in Oklahoma and anemic forests in Germany, breaks with Pinchot completely. I doubt there exists today a more complete regimentation of the human mind than ruthless utilitarianism. What spurs this creative turning point in the 1930s? Searching for answers to the human land riddle, Leopold regularly channels 
his thoughts and experiences through his profession's research. Increasingly as well, he invokes cultural lenses, Eastern literature, transcendentalism, Russian mysticism, Western history, European philosophy, arts and poetry. He is as apt to quote Shakespeare as Darwin. In time, Leopold reaches back to the expressions of an earlier place, especially as he worked on the game management book and traveled widely inspecting forests, he begins to reflect on the cultural geography of his first assignment in Arizona. In some, the tumultuous 30s, when more than a few progressive certainties toppled, provided an opening for indigenous values to resurface, shaping and reinforcing Leopold's other lessons. A noticeable outcome is that his later comments about Native Americans honor their values. A 1943 essay, for instance, Wildlife in American Culture, celebrates the Indian's reverence for the buffalo, what he calls a sustainer of both life and spirit. Elsewhere, his words seem tinged with regret for shutting down rather than listening to an entire culture. A humbled Leopold, his confidence is shattered more than once, at last joins the conversation on the mountain with the wolf and accepts this unfathomable meaning, aware that the hillside is ordered by unknown controls, as he calls them, too complex to manage. Rather than attempt to fix nature, Leopold senses he can and should learn from it. Over time, the slow fusion within Leopold spawns a land ethic that is, in part, a Western interpretation of indigenous land practices, made understandable and palatable to a dominant culture that's steeped in progress and boosterism and scientific certainty. Given his time, it's unlikely Leopold could stand before an audience of land managers and declare, we came from the earth, our mother as did the Nez Perce. But that is what his land ethic proposes, a community nurtured by indigenous cultures and framed by a new ecological understanding. Now, while some find this statement muddled or sentimental, this overlooks the defining feature of the land ethic, which is that our relationship to nature must be based on something other than use. It's a quality that follows directly from Native American views, where land was seldom valued as a commodity to be surveyed, fenced, or purchased. So while it's impossible to identify the Native American philosophy that defined Leopold's Southwest experiences, and we don't find any letters of his where he said, this is what I learned from Indian people, just as there's no single European view, we can point to a few threads that weave their way through the tapestry of many Aboriginal beliefs. Among them, reciprocity, re, excuse me, reciprocity and respect define the bond between all members of the land family. This relationship is a cultural bond shaped by something other than profit. And to speak of an individual owning land is like owning another person akin to slavery. Communally, nature plays a role in religious ceremonies, hunting rituals, arts and crafts, government, agricultural techniques, and other day-to-day -day uh, activities. And lastly, each generation has a responsibility to leave a healthy world for future generations. Now, these are not romantic, noble, savage fables. The millions of people in the Americas before a European contact used natural resources, built cities, diverted waterways, exploited animals, exterminated species, and transformed ecosystems. Complicating the interpretation, the continent was home to dozens of nations, most with multiple clans and villages. So to say that all Indian people in all places followed the same ecological blueprint is a non-starter. But having said that, more than 13,000 years of history suggests that the prevailing standards shaping indigenous uh, relationships to the land are restraint and reverence. Restraint because as people close to the land 
they embraced their dependence on Earth's resources, reverence because all was a gift from the Creator, whose reincarnated universe meant animals, trees, and rocks were other people. Navajo farmers call maize corn people, singing to each plant as they might a child. Considering their hunting skills, American Indians probably could have wiped out the buffalo, but they didn't, an act of ecological restraint and spiritual reverence. Had they practiced farming more intensively on the Southwest fragile soil, they could have destroyed their world, but most didn't. Historian Don Hughes writes, quote, Indian technology was certainly capable of doing more damage to the environment than was actually done, end quote. So it wasn't so much the tools available that determined land health, it was instead the wisdom to know what to do with the tools, a theme Leopold adopts. Quote, our tools to sac sacrifice to crack the atom, to command the tides, but they do not suffice for the oldest task in human history, to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. Among the ingredients, uh, excuse me, among the uh, indigenous belief systems which reflect this conviction, the Iroquois Confederacy Constitution, a 500 year old charter first recorded in the 19th century, decrees that human action should account for families seven generations beyond. Quote, the thickness of your skin shall be seven spans. Look and listen for the welfare of the whole people and have always in view, not only the present, but also the coming generations, end quote. In effect, the Iroquois outline a sustainable world. And while sustainability today has become a trendy and sometimes hollow buzzword, it was a theme for Leopold. Although he never uses the word in today's sense, many of his comments express sustainable ambitions. Rather than sustainability, he is apt to use stability or permanence. The true problem, he says, is to achieve both utility and beauty and thus permanence. If anyone understood that formula, Leopold comes to appreciate it was the cultures who had lived in, worked on, and learned from the hair trigger ecology of the Southwest. So what indigenous values then eventually show up in Leopold's ethic? I'm just going to go through these very quickly. Uh, it's not necessary to stop on each one, but what I've done is I've broken down Leopold's approach to land in these sort of 10 points. You know, what are the sort of themes that define him? And then how do those compare to Native American points of view? So as I go through this, for instance, the nature of land, when, when Leopold refers to land, of course, he's talking about all of its parts. The structure of the land is that humans are just one part of this. They're not at the top of the hierarchy. The design is that ecosystems are very complex. We can't really understand them or know them. We should learn from them. Preservation, because it's so important, and because every part of the land is, is significant, it should, all be, uh, it should all be preserved. You know what Leopold, that quote, that famous quote of Leopold's that, uh, you know, we should keep every cog and wheel. The responsibility is that because humans uh, can, can, can impact the, the environment and the ecosystem more than any, they have, a, they have a responsibility to preserve it. Love must be central. Character has to do with the fact that it's the land is what makes the American character. It's a theme that his his neighbor uh, uh, Jackson, you know, would uh, perpetuate. And diversity, of course, healthy environments are diverse environments, not monocultures. And lastly, what is the land ethic for? What is the land for? And this is uh, where we come back to the mountain. And Leopold sees, as he did in that trip to Germany, he realizes that the way we are with the land is the way we are with everything. And that the land ethic uh, encompasses more than forest, rivers, and wildlife. It's more than a tool to preserve resources and critters. It is instead a means to a greater good. As Leopold saw in Germany, the way we treat the land speaks volumes about the way we treat one another. And then there's the quote from Leslie there, the mountain was in their bones. There's that mountain again. 
In the end of Silco's novel Ceremony, her main character, Tayo, experiences an epiphany, his understanding of the universe's wholeness on a mountain. Admittedly, as these native voices reveal, there's little new in natives in, uh, in Leopold's important line of thought. Emerson found similar views in Eastern literature, and when Thoreau and Mary Austin celebrate Indian wisdom, they pay tribute to the same idea. To that time-honored ethic, Leopold skillfully adds ecology, updating and reconfirming scientifically what earlier cultures revered spiritually. Like Thoreau, who died relatively unknown beyond Concord, uh, Leopold was not well known outside of forestry circles when he died in 1948. And a Sand County Almanac sold only modestly when it was released the next year. Both men stood outside their time. Thoreau wrote as the Industrial Revolution was about to anoint technology a god, and Leopold's final thoughts were stifled by a post-World War II science mania that favored rationalism over his love and respect. Still, just as Leopold took decades to decipher indigenous values, a new generation weary of social convention eventually grasped the largely unplumbed implications of his poetry. And ultimately, like Walden, St. County Almanac emerged as one of the Bibles of environmentalism, even though it's, it eludes direct application. But that misses the point here. Leopold's book is an inquiry, not a how-to manual. It's meant to question and change our values, not prescribe rules. No important change in ethics, Leopold wrote, was ever accomplished without an internal change in our intellectual emphases and convictions. These convictions stem from a deep knowledge of one's place. We can be ethical only in relation to something we can feel, understand. Understand, that is, the land's great narrative, which explains why he taught ecology as a story. I'm trying to teach you, he wrote, he told his classes, that this alphabet of natural objects may be read. Native Americans held similar views. Seeing the world, says Luther Standing Bear, as a library and its books are stones and leaves and grass. Leopold uses the same metaphor. Thus, he who owns a veteran burr oak owns more than a tree. He owns historical, a historical library. The land narrative likewise includes this human chapter. The woodlot is in fact a historical document which faithfully records your personal philosophy. The landscape of any farm is the owner's portrait of himself. To appreciate that connection then, land literacy, like reading the printed page, should be taught because doing so will, quote, yield not only pleasure, but wisdom. Leopold sought that wisdom his whole life in classrooms, mountains, books, civic activism. It's a journey he would describe but not live to read. He suffered a heart attack while fighting a fire near the shack in 1948, just one week after learning that his essays had been accepted for publication. Aldo Leopold never saw his final words in print, nor did he have any idea how a Sand County Almanac would be regarded, selling millions of copies in dozens of languages, launching university programs and conservation organizations, and encouraging countless admirers to change careers to change themselves really, because ultimately Leopold is not about shaping landscapes, but about shaping our values. Conservation is a tool to do that. One reason the book endures is precisely because of this larger purpose, which was questioned by the publishers who expected him to write another nature book. In what turned out to be the book's most important passages, Leopold admonishes our hubris and suggests that the achievements we take such pride in, namely technological and economic advances, they're fine, but they're only tools that produce more tools. We are remodeling Alhambra with a steam shovel, he wrote, and we are proud of our yardage. Sadly, steam shovels are simply a means to an end. They don't tell society what a desirable end is. <clears throat> 
The depressing result is a landscape shaped by means, not ends, by tools, not wisdom. To prevent that, Leopold counsels, we should listen to the mountain, to the wolf, and to their partners in the soil. And we have mentors who have been here long who can teach us how to do that. If we learn from them as well and train our ecological ear just right, the land may whisper and we may hear that unfathomable meaning. Then you may hear it, a vast pulsing harmony, its score inscribed on a thousand hills, its notes the lives and deaths of plants and animals, its rhythms spanning the seconds and the centuries. 